Are you expecting a large change depending on the outcome of this election when it comes to U.S.-Germany ties? No. Uh, absolutely uh, not, Danny. I, what's interesting is if you look at the two likely chancellor candidates, you know, Olaf Scholz or Armin Laschet, they're both very pro-transatlantic. Mm. They're very pro-European. Uh, they, uh, there will not be a huge difference between them in terms of that. Interestingly enough, they've both been campaigning as the most likely successor to, uh, or co in a continuity message, uh, in succeeding Angela Merkel. So uh, I think the differences are really going to be, and Maria touched on it when she talked about even the possibility of what's known as a red-red-green mm. coalition with D-Linka, the differences are going to be much more on social policy and on Germany's domestic fiscal policy. And from the standpoint of the EU, the question of flexibility mm. in terms of European um, rescue mechanisms and, and that kind of thing, those are going to be the differences, not so much on the relationship with the mm. U.S. Good morning, Ambassador Emerson. On that note of the relationship with Germany, though, what about the fact that Schultz is not in favor of the 2% spending target by NATO? And of course, if there's with a coalition with the Greens, um, you know, they're looking to overhaul NATO completely. So will that not cause some kind of friction with the U.S.? I doubt. I mean, maybe a tad. Uh, but honestly, uh, the Greens, in some respects, are closer to the U.S. than either uh, the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats on China and on Russia. Uh, so, uh, and you, in all likelihood, if you had a uh, either an SPD or a CDU-led coalition, the Greens would likely get the foreign ministry. Uh, so that's uh, somewhat significant. So my guess is you'll have some areas where there'd be a little bit more attention and other areas where not. You know, I think during the Trump era, uh, the, it, there were only two things that seemed to matter to the United States, and they were the 2 percent and Nord Stream. Uh, I think the Biden administration has a much broader and deeper uh, understanding of the transatlantic relationship, and so there'll be a lot of things they can work on together. You know, I do have to say one of the issues that, in terms of sort of relations and foreign policy, one of the things that doesn't really seem to have come up is what's been happening in terms of the submarine contract with France. And I feel like France is trying to posture it as this is an EU issue. This isn't France versus the Anglosphere. This is all of the EU. Do you have any sense of, of what the reaction is in Germany, or, or rather what it should be to this? Well, I've just spent the la much of the last month in Germany. I was speaking at a conference uh, in Bavaria when all this uh, submarine news hit. And, uh, you, know, you know, the Germans, uh, well, first of all, there's a little bit of schadenfreude because yeah. apparently they lost out to the Australians in building these submarines in the first place. But for the most part, the Germans do have that reaction where there is a concern about, well, what has changed uh, in terms of Biden's we are back message? You know, you didn't really consult with the French. Our, uh, what does pivot to Asia really mean? Are you going to ignore the Europeans at the expense of focus on China? And uh, so there is that concern. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, it's not a well-placed concern because uh, we clearly understand, and I know this administration clearly understands, that the best way to stand up to China, to compete with China, is to work together hand in hand with our allies. So there'd be a push with that. Now, regarding China policy mm. in Germany, Germany is a little schizophrenic on that. You have particularly many in the business community, the auto companies, their, their profitability is much more China-focused than U.S.-focused. Right. And uh, Germany, uh, or China is a bigger trading partner for uh, Germany than the U.S. for sure. And so there's a little bit of we don't want to be completely buying into the rhetoric and the approach of the United States as it relates to China. Of course, the American message is, hey, folks, if you don't do that, you're going to find yourself in a pretty uncomfortable position a few mm. years down the road. Right. You talk about the schizophrenic approach to Germany, and I think, you know, that's very relevant when you talk about even though all the kind of leading candidates in the German election are hoping to be the successor to Merkel, it's pretty hard to be a successor to Merkel. I mean, she's been incredible in leading Europe uh, for such a long period of time. Um, so do you think that that means that Europe loses a little bit of a, a power in, in negotiations if they don't have a clear stance on the China issue or if they don't have that leader in Germany to at least provide that clear narrative around what they're doing on China? Well, Mark, I think you're absolutely right on that. I think Europe and, uh, and maybe the, the West uh, are, are going to miss Angela Merkel. Uh, you know, she's, uh, 
We used to call her uh, the Putin whisperer during the Russia-Ukraine situation. Uh, she clearly uh, has a very strong relationship with Xi Jinping. Uh, and, uh, and I do think that there will be a bit of a void and a bit of a gap, obviously, when you have somebody who's been that prominent on the world stage uh, stepping off. Uh, that being said, uh, just remember what people say, were saying when Angela Merkel became chancellor. Oh, she's not going to last more than a few months, uh, maybe a year at most. Uh, and they said the same thing about Helmut Kohl. So uh, I, I think um, whomever the new chancellor is will ultimately be able to step into their shoes. But there's no question there'll be a leadership void that probably won't be answered until we have the French elections uh, in 2022, because, of course, we will all be immediately turning our attention uh, to those elections. And let me just also make the point, I didn't hear it made earlier, these coalition negotiations could take six months. They're certainly going to take to the end of this year. So the election on Sunday uh, isn't the end of the discussion. And the winner of the election, whichever party has the most seats in the Bundestag, isn't necessarily guaranteed to win the chancellorship. Uh, that's what happened when um, uh, Helmut Schmidt became chancellor, in point of fact. Right. So, so what kind of happens in the meantime, then? We have this election. We have a coalition that needs to form. What really needs to be the number one priority of the newly formed government in Germany? Well, I, I think the number one priority will be continuing to get on top of COVID uh, and, uh, and, and making a decision in terms of uh, where they're going to be from the standpoint of the German, Germany's fiscal situation. I mean, is this going to be a post-COVID snapback to the black zero and more of an austerity kind of program? You hear that from some in Lindner's mm. party. You hear that from some in Merkel's party. Uh, or are, is there going to be greater flexibility uh, in terms of fiscal spending and sort of a recognition that for the health of Europe uh, and 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 ultimately the health of the transatlantic relationship, there needs to be a, a little bit more flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, pumping money into the system. So we'll see about that. I think also trade negotiations, uh, trying to, um, uh, you know, get, get a, uh, on top of the post-Brexit situation, trying to see whether it will be possible to have a skinny down TTIP. Remember right. that failed a number of years ago, the free trade agreement between the U.S and the EU, and, and also, I think, relationship with China, and in particular, how that pertains to the transatlantic relationship. I think those right. will be the big priorities. Right, and of course, China, a big economic question as well, coming in for whatever the new oh, government yeah. is. Uh, Ambassador Emerson, it's been such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for making this stop on your trip across the Atlantic. Thank you, Danny, for having me. One really wonderful conversation, very fascinating. Thanks again to US, former U.S. Ambassador to Germany, John B. Emerson.